so you are aware. Um, it's 12 noon, and I'd like to welcome everyone to our webinar considerations for selecting and purchasing hay. One second, admitting a few people here. Um, I'm Lee Bridgman. I'm an Ag and Horticulture Program Assistant with University of Maryland Extension in Queen Anne's County, and I'll help facilitating the session. Throughout the presentation, we will use the chat for questions, so please uh, add your chat in there and we will get to them as soon as we can. I'd like to remind you of our upcoming webinar that is on May 25th, and that one will be talking about clean green, which is making green and economical cleaning products for your home. As a reminder, again, our presentation will be recorded today. You'll get an email that will be sent directly to you with the link to the archived presentation, and you can feel free to share that with anyone you would like. The complete collection of archived webinars is on the Women in Ag website. Um, and now I would like to turn the presentation over to Amanda Graff to talk about selecting and purchasing hay. All right, thank you very much, Leanne, and um, thanks to everybody for joining us uh, live this afternoon. Um, like Leanne said, we are going to be discussing um, a variety of considerations that we need to be thinking about when we're um, making our hay purchasing decisions. Um, so just first to kind of uh, start everything off, um, I wanted to, um, you know, kind of take a step back and remind everybody, you know, what really is hay and just do a very, very brief overview of kind of the hay baking process because um, what happens during that process is what affects the end quality of our hay and all of the factors that we're gonna be discussing today. So when we think about what exactly is hay, um, basically it's the drying and packaging of forage for preservation. And we do this so that we can feed it to our livestock at a later date, right? We have, when we don't have, you know, fresh pasture or other forage options available. So it allows us to kind of um, supply that forage at times of the year when we might not have pasture. If we think about the haymaking process, um, there's several steps that go into it that, you know, if we are, you know, uh, a producer who is raising livestock but not making our own hay, we may not know all of the steps that go into this hay making process. So um, just briefly to kind of go over that, um, first it starts with the hay being mowed or cut. Um, and that's really uh, an important factor because it determines the maturity of the hay, which we'll talk about maturity um, several times throughout today's presentation. Um, after it's cut, uh, you'll oftentimes see that hay laying out in the field to dry. So it requires, you know, depending on the weather and other conditions, anywhere from, you know, two to four days usually to dry um, hay in the field to get it down to an appropriate moisture content um, where we can effectively preserve that hay and not um, run into the risk of spoilage when we go to store it. After it's sufficiently dry, um, the farmer will come in and rake that hay. So raking it into those windrows that you can see. Um, there's obviously several different you know, types of equipment that, be, that can be used for this, but basically they're raking it into a windrow so that the last step, the baler, can come through and um, gather up that windrow and package it into the hay bale. Again, there's you know, several different types of balers and different styles that you may see, but this cut dry, rake and bale process is really the fundamentals of how our hay is made. So why do we do this? Well, like I said, um, we oftentimes need to feed hay for a variety of different reasons. Could be that we don't have enough pasture. Um, we, you know, we may not have enough pasture to support the amount of livestock that we have on our farm. It could be, of course, when pasture is not available. So, you know, in the winter time, when things are snow covered or forages are not um, growing, uh, we can, you know, need to feed hay then, sometimes even in the summertime, if our forages are going through their summer slump and they're um, going dormant for a period in the summertime, we may need to be feeding some hay at that point. We can also use hay for other things, like if we need to rest or renovate our pastures, we need to take the animals off of them for a while. Um, we can supplement them with hay instead. And then, of course, um, there are always those times when we need to confine our livestock to anything from a paddock to a stall to a trailer. For various reasons, um, so we will we will re usually rely on hay in those circumstances. 
So um, that's kind of, you know, just a very, very brief background on, you know, the haymaking process and the times when hay might be needed. So now we're going to kind of get into um, determining if a given hay is appropriate for our farm and for our livestock and for our situation. And there are several criteria that we're going to go over when we're selecting and purchasing hay. Um, so we're going to make our way through this list as we go through the rest of the presentation. The first thing that we're going to start with is the type and size of bale. Um, there are you know, several different types of hay equipment uh, for making that hay. And um, as a result, there are several different types and sizes of hay bales um, that we have to choose from. So um, we need to first decide which of those types will work best for our farm. So when I say the type or size, um, this can be broken down into really two main categories, maybe three. Um, the first is uh, small square bales, um, which are you know, seen in the, in the pictures here. This is what you know, a lot of us uh, think of when we think of hay and hay production. They're usually uh, on the smaller side, anywhere between 40 and 80 pounds. On um, these small bales have the advantage that they're pretty easy to handle. You, know, you can pick them up and carry them yourself. Um, they're easier to store in terms of, you know, we're physically able to go ahead and stack those bales. Um, and you know, manipulate them on our own or store them in places where we only have a little bit of room. Um, the downside or one of the downsides of small square bales is they can be a little bit more labor intensive, both on the production end and also when we're you know, moving them and stacking them and carrying them around. Um, it does require a little bit more manual effort, if you will, um, in that sense. And because they come in a small con uh, con con contained package, Oftentimes we'll find that buying hay on small square bales is a little bit more expensive if we compare things on a dollar per ton basis. It's just like, you know, when you go to the grocery store, usually things that um, come in a smaller packaging are more expensive on a unit basis. Um, the same concept applies to hay. Um, when it comes in a smaller package, it's usually, not always, but usually more expensive um, on a unit or a dollar per ton basis. Um, that said, small square bales are very common on smaller farms if we don't have a whole lot of livestock or we don't have a lot of space to store or equipment to move um, larger bales, um, they can be really convenient. The other kind of main size, um, which comes in two different shapes, is the larger bales. So they can come as a large round bale, which you can see in the top figure, or as a large square bale, which you can see in the bottom image. Um, these large bales usually range somewhere in the 800 to 1200 pound range. Um, so obviously a lot heavier and not something that we can physically lift or move ourselves. So we do need a tractor or skid steer or something to be able to move these bales around. Because they're larger, um, they are a little bit less labor intensive in terms of we usually aren't out there physically picking them all up. Um, so they come in a larger package, we use the equipment to pick them up. Um, and again, because they come in that larger package, they're usually a little bit less expensive if we compare things on a dollar per ton basis. Um, oftentimes these larger bales are a little bit less practical if we only have a few animals. Um, you know, we don't necessarily need that huge amount of hay. We don't wanna be leaving you know, a large round bale sitting out in the weather and, um, and degrading um, over time before our animals can consume it all. So, they're usually a little bit less practical for smaller operations, um, but can be more practical and more time efficient um, when we have more animals or more mouths to feed. Um, so deciding which works best for your farm will of course um, you know, depend on what livestock species you have, what type of storage you have, if you have the equipment um, necessary to move those large bills around. The next two criteria kind of um, really go hand in hand. So I've kind of lumped them together and that is affordability or how much does that hay cost, um, which is of course a big consideration and the weight of that bale. And I added these together because the weight of that bale really factors a lot into the affordability. So we really need to be considering these two things um, together. So um, really it's important to um, calculate the price and weight of the hay that you're going to be purchasing um, to get the best bang for your buck. So you really need to be making comparisons, pricing comparisons on a per weight basis. So not by the bale, but actually by the weight. So dollars per ton. And that's because that allows us to compare things equally across these different sizes, across these different 
um, weights of different hay bales. So just as an example, um, if we have here um, in this picture, we're considering purchasing um, 100 bales from you know, producer A, and these bills are priced at $5 each. So if we want 100, that's a total of $500. We may have another option from another producer that is also for 100 bales, but these are priced at $6 each. So that would be a total of $600 for the, the entire um, hay wagon. Just looking at this initially, of course, you know, they're both small square bales, um, you know, assuming the quality is relatively similar, we're obviously leaning towards the example on the left, right? Producer A, because you know, we can save ourselves $100 uh, right off the bat. Um, but here's where that per weight basis um, factors in. So say in this example, producer A's bales weigh 35 pounds each. So they're a little bit on the smaller side. Um, if we do some math, the total weight there is 3,500 pounds or 1.75 tons for our 100, pound, for our 100 bales at 35 pounds each. If we do the same calculation for the other producer, um, say those bales in this case weigh 50 pounds each. So our total weight there is actually 5,000 pounds or two and a half tons of hay. When we compare the cost on that per weight basis or that per ton basis, rather than on the equivalent number of bales, it actually comes up that you know the producer A's cost is $286 per ton. If we take that total cost divided by the amount of tons we'd be getting, we get $286 per ton. And if we do the same thing for producer B, it actually comes out to $240 per ton. So that's why it's really important to compare things on a weight basis or dollars per ton basis and not simply by the bale. Because even when they're both small square bales, um, and they look similar, um, that little bit of weight difference per bale can, can really make a difference in the bottom line. The same sort of example or same sort of comparison can be made when we're comparing, say, a small square bale to a large round bale or even a large square bale. So again, this is, you know, same type of example. We have that same producer A on the left there, but this time comparing it to a set of um, 10 large round bales which um, because they're larger and you know, they're, there's more hay per bale are of course gonna be more expensive. So if we're getting 10 of them at $70 each, that comes out to $700. Um, again, if we do the calculation to figure out the weight, um, on the left here, we have the same example that we just used, so 1.75 tons. On the right, those bales weigh say 800 pounds each. Um, so our total weight there is 8,000 pounds or four tons total. Um, so again, when we divide this out, um, the bales on the left are going to give us a $286 per ton price, and the bales on the right are actually going to only be $175 per ton. Um, so this is pretty pretty typical. Um, you know, we often see um, you know different comparisons based on the bale, but um, we do usually see a reduction in the dollar per ton basis um, when we buy things in the larger round bales. Um, so if you're trying to make comparisons between different hays and comparing them in terms of affordability, make sure you're factoring that weight in. So the next thing to consider, um, which we're going to spend a little more time on, is the quality of that hay, because um, obviously this is a really important factor um, with when we're going to be feeding this hay to our livestock. So the question here is, what is the quality of that hay or what is the nutritional value of that hay? The first thing to remember is that there are a ton of different factors that affect forage quality. And forage quality varies greatly depending on a huge range of things, everything from maturity, leakiness, different forage species, the soil fertility that a producer will, will use in a field or will um, have their field at, the time of day or year that that hay was harvested, if it was you know, a fresh forage versus a, a, a harvested forage, how it was harvested and the storage conditions that were being used, and then if there are any um, anti-quality or anti-nutritive factors there. So there's a whole host of things to consider, um, but really when it comes down to looking at forage quality and assessing forage quality, we really have two methods to evaluate our, our hay quality, right? So the first is a forage test or a forage analysis. So that's where we're actually going out, um, collecting a sample of that hay, sending that sample off to a lab, having them analyze 
that hay for the nutrient content. The other um, option is a visual assessment. So that's just simply visually looking at that hay and looking at some different factors, um, which we'll get to in a minute uh, to address or get, get an idea or a feel for the quality of that hay. Of course, between these two, a forage test or a forage analysis is much more accurate and really the only way to determine a true quality of our hay. So I did want to stress that you know forage analyses are important and um, we can really not determine the actual quality or the actual nutritive value of our forage from simply feeling it or looking at it or smelling it or you know looking at any of those appearance factors. We really can only evaluate the forage nutritive value or the nutrients present in that hay with a forage analysis. Um, and just you know to kind of further illustrate that, uh, here we have a figure with um, four different hay samples that were brought to one of the national uh, forage meetings. So all kinds of experts, producers, um, industry people, academic people, um, all looked at these four hays. Um, and you see A, A through D there. Um, those are the four hay samples along with their quality. So you can see that hay D was the highest quality, hay C was second, hay B was third, hay A was in the lowest quality. Well, um, at this you know, meeting, uh, all of these experts were asked to rank those hays in order of quality, simply based on their appearance. So they couldn't see the forage analysis. They were just looking at the appearance of those hays and ranking them on what they thought was best to worst. Here's the percent of those um, experts who thought that each of those different types of hay was the best. So we can actually see that 45% of people thought that hay A was the best when actually it was the lowest in quality. Only 20% of people actually thought that hay D was the best quality, which was correct. Um, so that's just to illustrate that we really do need to rely on a, on a forage analysis um, when we are um, evaluating our hay. We're not gonna really go into forage analysis today because it's not really um, the, the point of today's talk. Um, but if we look at a forage analysis, we do see a whole host of um, you know, factors that we are you know, given information on, everything from you know, protein content, fiber content, the different types of carbohydrates that are present, um, some minerals like calcium and phosphorus, the energy content of that hay. Um, so we really can think of this as kind of like a nutrition facts label. Um, for our hay. It tells us, you know, the actual um, vitamins and minerals and carbohydrates that are present in that hay. Um, so a forage analysis is beneficial for several different reasons. One might be assigning a market value to forages. So when we're purchasing or selling hay, um, having that forage analysis to, to know the nutrition in that hay can be really helpful. Of course, when we're making feeding decisions, so we want to know, you know, be able to match our forage quality to our requirements, our nutritional requirements for our animals. Um, so we can use a forage analysis to help make those decisions. Um, and then when we're, you know, to go along with that, also formulating rations or determining if we need to supplement and if so, what we need to supplement with. Um, all those things, questions can be kind of answered with a forage analysis. And then lastly, um, making storage decisions. So. Of course, usually we want to store our best quality forage inside if we have you know, limited amounts of storage space. Um, so knowing which of those forages are higher in quality can help us decide you know, which ones to prioritize and which ones to store inside. Um, like I said, we're not really going to get into forage analysis today, but actually um, last year, the webinar that I gave for the Women in Egg um, this webinar series was on forage sampling and forage analysis. So I did put the link to that video um, here for everybody if they're more interested and they want to learn more about taking a forage analysis and how to do that, um, I encourage you to, to check out that video. Um, today, what we're going to focus on is more of the visual side of things. So um, we don't always have access to a forage analysis when we're purchasing hay or when we're deciding which hay to purchase. Um, it's you know never a, a bad idea to ask for that or see if, uh, if a seller has that information. Um, but if not, there are some things that we can look at visually to help us gauge or determine which is going to be the better deal or the better quality hay. So what we're going to do is go through each of these different um, factors and talk about how we can assess our hay based on each of these different things. So the first thing, of course, is to start off with maturity. You know, I mentioned that forage maturity is really kind of the biggest factor in determining our hay quality. So 
the time when that tractor goes out into that field and cuts that hay is the time that determines how mature that forage is going to be um, in that end product. So this is really the biggest determinant of our nutritional value. A more vegetative, more leafy forage that was you know, cut at a more immature stage is going to have a higher leaf concentration. It's going to have more energy. It's going to have more protein present in that hay. Um, so we want, you know, for a high quality hay, we want something more vegetative and leafy um, to give us that high quality. A more mature hay is going to be a little bit more stemmy. It's going to be a little bit higher in, higher in fiber and a little bit lower in quality. So as those forages continue to grow and mature, they get a little bit more fibrous and they have a little bit less you know, energy and protein content present in that hay. So um, a more mature hay is gonna be that, that higher fiber option. This is just to illustrate that point that forage maturity does play a really big role in forage quality. Um, so you can see, um, you can see here this solid uh, line is digestible dry matter. Um, and you can see the decline in digestible dry matter as that grass in this example is aging. So as weeks go by and that forage gets more mature, that dry matter, digestible dry matter concentration decreases. And this dotted line here is the protein content. And the same thing is said for protein content. So as that forage matures and as that uh, protein concentration or as that forage grows and matures, that protein content will go down. So we really have that inverse relationship between forage maturity and forage nutritive value. So, you know, we might not always know what, you know, stage of maturity a forage was at when a producer went into a field and cut it, right? But there are some visual indicators that we can look for when we're looking at our hay to help us kind of gauge um, if that forage was more mature or less mature when it was cut. Um, the biggest thing to look for is the presence of seed heads, if it's a grass hay, so grass seed heads, or flowers, if it's a legume hay, um, like, you know, alfalfa, something like that. Um, we can look for presence of the flowers. And the other thing we can look for for maturity is um, the stem, the, the concentration of stems, so how many stems there are, and also the thickness of those stems. So the thicker the stems are, the more mature stems we see in that hay, the lower in quality that hay is going to be. So here in this example, we have a mature grass hay over here on the left compared to an immature grass hay over here on the right. And right off the bat, you can see that this one looks a lot finer, uh, maybe a little bit more leafy, less stems, and maybe less thick of stems than this one over here, which looks like it's a little bit coarser, a little bit tougher, um, probably a little bit more fibrous, and has a little bit higher stem concentration. We can also see that this one over here on the left has all of these um, little seed heads present. So we can see this seed heads in that hay, um, which are another indication that that hay is more mature. So what that tells us is that this hay over here is more mature and it's going to be lower in quality versus this hay over here is more immature and it's going to be higher in quality. Um, one thing that always comes up or gets talked about along with forage maturity is cutting um, and if hay cutting matters or not. Um, so basically, you know, for anyone who might not be familiar with that term, cutting is the number associated with whatever time a hay field was cut during the growing season. So the first cutting is the first time that hay was cut during the year. So um, if we have here just kind of an example of, you know, cool season grasses like orchard grass, fescue, um, go through this typical growth curve throughout the growing season where we have a lot of forage production here in the late spring, early summer, they go through kind of that summer slump in the middle of the summer when things get hotter and drier. And then we have additional growth occurring here in the fall. Um, so that's kind of, you know, the general growth pattern. Um, so the first cutting would just simply be whatever time of year that producer makes their first cut. So they first make their hay. A lot of times this will be sometime in May or June, um, depending on the producer and the timing and, and where they're located. Um, and then it just goes up from there. So second cut will be whatever the second time the producer cuts that hay. Third cut will be whatever the third time they cut that hay for the year. So if I were to ask you, true or false, first cutting hay is lower in quality. Um, I would guess that most people would say that's true. First cutting hay is lower in quality. 
Um, really, the answer to that is it depends on the stage of maturity when it was cut. A first cutting hay can be just as high of quality as a second cutting hay or a third cutting hay if it was cut at the right maturity. What often happens is in the spring, the first cutting of the year, um, many of our cool season grasses really only produce seed heads one time per year, and that happens in the spring. So a lot of times um, we see a little bit higher maturity with our first cutting hay because it's when those grasses are producing their seed heads and they get a little bit more mature a little bit quicker. It also in the spring can be a little bit harder sometimes to find a window to make hay. So remember we said we need that like two to four days of dry weather for that hay to be, to be dried and properly made. Um, it can be a little bit harder in the spring to find a dry window with you know, good weather when a producer has time to make that hay. So sometimes, you know, if it's a lot of rainy weather, if producers are busy planting other, other crops or, you know, harvesting other crops, um, it can be a little bit harder to get that hay made in a timely manner in the spring. Um, so that's why oftentimes hay um, with a first cutting is, tends to be lower in quality, um, but really it's not because it was the first cutting, it's because it was cut when it was a little bit more mature. Um, so remember that the cutting alone does not predict the nutrient content. The quality can be great or, or terrible on any cutting, um, and all cuts can have good quality hay. It just really depends on the stage of maturity when that hay was cut. Um, so remember that when we're looking at hay. The next factor that we can look at visually that is kind of closely correlated or closely tied with forage maturity is the leafiness of that hay. So you know, we said that when forages are more vegetative, they're usually more leafy. Um, leaves are uh, higher in quality compared to the stems. So they're the most nutrient rich part of the plant. And just as an example, an, an alfalfa leaf, if you were to just test the quality of a leaf of alfalfa, it could have a relative forage quality. So an overall forage quality of, you know, as high as 550 compared to a stem, if you were to test the quality of just the stem of that alfalfa, it could be anywhere down to you know, 70 to 80 in the uh, relative forage quality. And obviously there's a, a lot of variation there, but um, just illustrating that you know, leaves are more nutrient rich and are higher in quality compared to stems. Like I said, this is very closely tied to maturity. So um, as our forages grow and mature. This is um, time down here on the x-axis. So as our forages mature and as time goes on, the, stem, the concentration of stems increases as a percent of the total weight. So the percent of stem proportion increases over time and the percent of leaves present decreases over time. And that's simply due to that you know, relationship with maturity. Um, but, as, but that means that you know, a forage cut over here will have a higher proportion of stems and a lower proportion of leaves, and it will be lower in quality. However, um, even though that is closely tied to maturity, there is other ways that we can adjust or influence the leaf to stem percent or the percent of leaves and stems. And that's because leaves can also be lost during the haymaking process. So depending on how well um, manage that hay was as it was being dried and as it was being raked and as it was being baled, um, we can lose some leaves during that um, hay making process and the amount of leaves lost will of course affect the resulting quality. Um, so remember that a good quality hay is going to have a lot more leaves than stems, so we want to be looking for those nice fine um, leaves when we're looking for a higher quality hay. And just to further illustrate that, um, this was a study done at the University of Wisconsin, and um, they were, you know, looking at the relationship between forage quality, which is down here along the x-axis, and leaf percentage, which is over here on the y-axis. And you can see this very strong correlation with all a whole amount, huge amount of different forage samples. Um, it came up to 71% of the variability in forage quality was really depending on the leaf percentage. So. Um, that leaf concentration really is important in terms of forage quality. All right, the next thing that we can look at and assess when we're looking at different hays is the forage species. So we know that we have a lot of different forage species. You know, we have cool season forages, we have warm season forages, we have grass species, we have legume species like clover or alfalfa. 
Um, we have perennial forages, you know, like our orchard grass and our timothy. We have annual forages that can be um, made into hay, um, like oats or some other small grains. Um, so there's a lot of different forage species out there. And a lot of these different forage species um, do have slightly different trends in terms of forage quality. Um, so this graph is just showing a number of different quality measures. So um, digestible energy, crude protein, um, some fiber values, NDF and ADF, calcium and phosphorus, non-structural carbohydrates, and then our RFQ or our overall forage quality. And it's showing a range for cool season grasses here on the left, compared to warm season grasses here in the middle, compared to legumes here on the right. And again, these are all dependent, you know, not just on the species, but on a lot of other factors. But if we kind of look at some general trends, um, legumes tend to be higher in energy compared to our grass species. Legumes also tend to be higher in protein compared to our grasses. And warm season grasses tend to be a little bit lower in protein compared to cool season grasses. Legumes tend to have the lowest concentration of fiber um, or NDF. Warm season grasses tend to have the highest concentration of fiber or NDF. Legumes tend to have a little bit higher concentration of some um, vitamins and minerals, um, particularly calcium is one that's usually higher in a legume um, forage compared to a grass forage. Um, as a result, uh, for anyone looking at the calcium to phosphorus ratio, um, it tends to be a little bit higher in our legume species compared to our cool season or warm season grass species. Non-structural carbohydrates tend to be a little bit lower in both legumes and warm season grasses compared to our cool season grasses. And overall, our forage quality tends to be a little bit higher in our legumes, um, moderate for our cool season grasses and lowest for our warm season grasses. Um, the caveat there is um, this is true if everything is kind of on a similar playing field. So, you know, made in a similar way, um, grown in a similar way, at a, cut at a similar level of maturity, um, but on average, assuming all else is equal, legumes tend to be the highest quality, cool season grasses tend to be next, and warm season grasses tend to be more moderate in forage quality. Um, to kind of illustrate that a little bit, if we look at, these are um, different species of forages and their associated quality that were submitted to the University of Georgia Forage Testing Lab. Um, so it's just broken up by different species. Um, and it's all shown as relative forage quality. So kind of that overall quality value. For each of these, this little dark um, rectangle in the middle represents the average. And then this colored horizontal bar represents kind of the range in the quality of samples that were submitted. So again, you can see that big range in quality even within a specific species. And that's depending on, you know, on all those other factors. But if we look for some general trends, so here's our fescue orchard grass, so our cool season grasses. Here's our something like Bermuda grass, so warm season grass. You can see the average is slightly lower for those warm season grasses. And here's our alfalfa or other legumes, which again, the average is slightly higher um, compared to our grass species. So we see those same trends emerging when we look at actual forage samples submitted to the lab. Um, but remember that there is that range. So um, those are just you know, trends that, that um, are usually true, but we do still see a range in quality. So when we're actually looking at our hay, um, we can look, we, we, well, we can ask the producer, you know, what species were present in that field, but we can also um, look for evidence of different species in our hay samples. Um, this is not always easy, especially, you know, if it's just a plain grass hay and it's relatively immature, there's no seed heads, it's usually very, very difficult to tell what uh, forage species was present. Um, but we can usually distinguish something like an alfalfa hay compared to our grass hays by looking for the presence of those alfalfa leaves. Um, if the grasses do have some seed heads in that hay, we can look like here is an orchard grass seed head um, here in this one. And here, this one has some timothy seed head. So we know that that is a timothy hay, or at least the hay has timothy in it. Um, so familiarizing yourself with what some of the seed heads of those predominant hay species looks like um, can be pretty helpful. Um, just put these pictures up there you know, for your reference so you can kind of start to recognize maybe what an orchard grass seed head versus timothy versus fescue, um, and then what that alfalfa looks like compared to some of our grass species. Um, the next thing that we need to consider is color. So 
I'm guessing if I were to poll you all um, and ask everybody which of these two hays, this one over here on the left versus this one over here on the right, um, which one you would rather purchase, I'm assuming everybody would say this one over here, right? Um, this looks like a nice green color compared to this one over here, which looks a lot more yellow, um, looks like it's been bleached or, or maybe is you know just overall worse appearance based purely on the color. Um, the key here, the caveat is if we actually look at the forage test for these two different batches of hay, um, we'll see that they're very, very similar in their quality. So RFQ for both is right around 180, crude protein for both is right around 19%, and the energy content for both is right around 66%, 65 or 66%. So really in terms of quality or in terms of nutrition, these are exactly the same. Um, but if this one was a lot less expensive um, or you know, for whatever other reason easier to access, um, you know, don't be turned off by it just because it has that yellow color. Um, make sure we're looking at all those other quality factors and, and relying on our forage analysis if we can um, to look at the actual nutrient content. Um, so don't get too hung up on color. Um, people, you know, always look at color first because it's the easiest thing sometimes to look at, but it's usually not as important as you might think. Um, it is true that we can get some discoloration or some yellowing um, due to things like a higher forage maturity, um, which of course, you know, we might be wanting to avoid. Um, but discoloration can also be a result of things like conditions during when it was drying in the field, um, you know, the amount of sun bleaching that it got, different storage conditions, um, and oftentimes those looks can be deceiving. You know, we may find that that hay is nice and bright green on the inside or bright green on the inside of the stack, and that discoloration is purely because it was, you know, on the outside of the stack or exposed to the sun while it was being stored. Um, so overall, remember that yes, green is appealing and it can indicate high quality, um, but it's not always the, the you know, the, the, end, the end all be all, um, you know, our weed species that may be undesirable to have in our hay can also be a nice bright green color. And our bleached hay can still contain um, a lot of essential good quality nutrients. So um, just remember not to get too hung up on the color. Another thing we can look at visually is the odor of that hay. So we want hay that smells fresh and clean. Um, we, a musty odor usually indicates that that hay was put up a little too wet or it might be more likely to mold um, if it was too wet. So we really want hay that is dust and mold free. So if we see a lot of evidence of mold um, or hay that's really dusty, that's probably something that we want to avoid. Um, that moldy, dusty or wet hay can really affect our intake and palatability for our livestock. It can affect nutrient absorption of that hay. Um, lowering our production and potentially causing um, health issues in, in more severe cases. So um, that's something we always want to check for when we're looking at hay. And the other thing that we want to check for is anti-quality factors. They may not always be this obvious, right? I really hope no one has seen a giant snake um, bound up in their hay in this area at least. Um, but you know there can be other things that are considered anti-quality factors that you might need to look out for in your hay. Um, this can be anything from mold to dirt clods to dust to weeds to straw, um, corn stalks, sticks that are you know wrapped up in the hay, garbage. Um, here's just an example. You know, if a hay is along a road and people throw their trash out the window, that may end up getting bailed up with the hay. Um, you know, this is just obviously like a little plastic bag or something um, that actually got wrapped up in that hay bale. So. Um, just look at things and you know, be aware to, or be on the lookout for some of those anti-quality factors or things that we might not want present in our hay. So when it comes to determining hay quality, um, I've just put together a brief list of things to ask the producer or a producer based on kind of what we've just covered. Uh, the first thing is if they have a forage analysis, um, they're not always gonna have one, but it's worth at least asking. Some producers might have one or might be willing to get one if you ask for it. Um, you should ask about the maturity. So a more mature hay, remember, will be lower in quality. So they should be able to tell you at least a rough idea of the maturity of that hay when it was cut. You can ask about what forage species are present in the hay. So um, if there was a higher concentration of legumes, of course, that'll be usually higher in quality. Um, you can ask if where the hay was harvested. So 
a lot of times some of those anti-quality things like you know garbage or trash or whatever, if hay is harvested from roadside ditches, um, it can be more likely to have you know some of those anti-quality factors or other weeds or other undesirable things in there. Um, so usually we want to avoid uh, purchasing hay that was harvested from a roadside ditch. Um, you can also ask if the hay was rained on at all. Um, so rain usually leads to some dry matter losses and some loss of soluble nutrients. So things like non-structural carbohydrates, which can lower the energy concentration of that forage. Um, this really is dependent on the amount of rain and the timing of the rain. So don't be too concerned if it was just a very brief sprinkle or something like that, um, but it is something that we kind of ask. And we can also ask if the hay, you know, if it's been stored for a while, that is, has it been stored inside or under cover? So we know that storing our hay properly really preserves the quality. And if it was stored uncovered and exposed to the weather, it's gonna be much more susceptible to mold or deterioration. And finally, we can ask um, them, you know, if, they, if their hay field was fertilized or you know, sprayed for weeds at all. Um, this might, you know, if you're not familiar with things like soil fertility or different weeds, it might not tell you a lot, but if they do indicate that they have, you know, fertilized their hay, they have, you know, controlled weeds and that kind of thing, um, it's usually indicative that they're, you know, managing their, their, their hay stand well, um, they're using good management, and as a result, it's likely better quality hay. The last thing for forage quality to consider is that, you know, nutritional needs of our livestock species vary. And it may be that you don't necessarily need the very highest quality hay that you can purchase. Um, so here we have, you know, a spectrum in relative forage quality ranging from a little bit lower up to a higher relative forage quality. And we can see that based on our different, you know, groups or classes of livestock, we have a range in what those species or those classes actually require in terms of forage quality. So um, I just pulled out horses as an example for this one. Um, a, you know, an idle horse, or you, you know, you could even include a dry cow, um, has very low nutritional needs, and they don't really need the highest quality forage that we can get. Um, as we work our way up, if we have you know a working horse or a pregnant broodmare. They're of course going to need a little bit more nutrition from their forage, um, and then you know as we work our way up a little further, you know a, a nursing mare or a horse in very intense exercise is going to need a much higher quality forage. Um, same thing for cattle. You know lactating beef cows are going to be kind of in the middle. Um, a really a, a milking dairy cow is going to be among those that are the highest that have the highest requirements for um, quality in their ration. Um, so take that into consideration and, you know, again, using our, our horse example, if we have a horse that's, you know, little, little activity or light activity, we might want to look for something that's lower in energy, lower in protein, and maybe more moderate in fiber concentration. A more mature grass hay might be appropriate for that, you know, livestock species. Um, if we have, you know, more of a moderate activity um, horse, we might want to look for something that's a little bit more moderate in energy, moderate in protein. Uh, a little bit more moderate in the fiber content. So maybe an immature grass hay might be most appropriate um, for that particular group of horses. And then of course, if we have um, those that are in very heavy activity or you, know, you could also include young growing animals or um, milking, you know, uh, uh, lactating dairy cattle in this group, um, those are gonna have the highest energy and highest protein requirement and the lowest uh, fiber requirements. So maybe adding in a legume or a mixed, you know, alfalfa grass um, hay might be appropriate for those types of, of those groups or those classes. Um, so consider, you know, the type, the quality of the hay, but then also consider um, what your specific animal or your specific livestock um, need in terms of quality. Um, and then the last thing that we um, need to figure out is quantity. So do we have enough hay to meet our needs? And um, you can figure this out with some fairly simple uh, calculations, but you do need to know several things. So you need to know the average body weight of your livestock, because that's going to affect how much they eat. Of course, the number of animals, um, the average intake of the animals, and by intake, I mean that different species consume a different percent of their body weight. So here's just a rough idea um, showing the average dry matter intake based on percent of their body weight for these different groups of, of livestock. So beef cattle, 
one to three percent, dairy cattle two and a half to four and a half percent. Goats consume a higher percent usually on average in terms of percent body weight. Um, horses one and a half to three and sheep two to five. And of course you'll see there's a range for all of these and that just depends on the life stage and the demands of that animal. So you know, say you have a lactating beef cow is gonna be on the higher end versus a mature dry beef cow is gonna be on the lower end. Um, and then you need to figure out roughly how many days you think you're gonna to need to be feeding hay. Um, and then an estimated amount of waste. So, you know, we're not gonna get into this today, but how we store and how we feed our hay can have a really big impact on the percentage of waste, hay waste that we're seeing. So anything from 5% up to 60% or even higher um, can be wasted or lost depending on our storage and our feeding management. So um, you need to factor that in as well when we're figuring out our hay needs. So just as an example of you know, what this calculation might look like, here we have a herd of six beef cattle. Um, say we're, we have about a thousand pounds, so mature uh, body weight, and we're going to use a dry matter intake of 2%. So you know, these are just average, um, you know, grown, uh, mature beef cattle. And we think we need to be feeding hay for about five months or 150 days. And we're probably using, you know, some sort of um, hay feeder or, or a, min a, a strategy for minimizing waste, um, but not super intensive about it. So maybe we say 20% um, waste on average. So the first thing we need to do is figure out the amount of hay needed per cow per day. So a thousand pounds of body weight, we said that they're going to eat 2% of that body weight, which gives us 20 pounds per day of dry matter for one cow. Um, then we need to figure out the amount for the whole period. So that one cow is going to be eating 20 pounds, but will be needing to eat hay for 150 days. So that's up to 3,000 pounds to feed that one cow for that whole five month period. Then we calculate the amount for all the cows. So of course we have more than one. So we have 3,000 pounds times all six of our cows means we have a need for 18,000 pounds of hay to feed those animals for that five month period. And then we wanna factor in that waste percent. So we said we were gonna be using about 20% waste or we thought we'd be around that number. So we wanna add 20% on top of that um, to factor in the hay that's gonna be wasted and not gonna be fed to those animals. So that comes out to 21,600 pounds of hay on average, which if you know we're using, say for this example, 900 pound round bales, um, we can divide that 21, 1,600 by 900 pounds, and we need around 24 bales to cover those cattle for that five month period. Um, so obviously your numbers are gonna be different than this, um, but this is just an example of you know, the type of calculation that you can do to kind of figure out how much hay you're gonna be needing and make sure that you have enough um, to supply your animals for the time period that you need. Um, so that answered our quantity question. Um, the very last question is accessibility. So how are we going to be transporting or how are we going to be getting that hay? Um, do you have means for transporting hay? Are you going to be picking it up? Um, and if so, are you going to be able to get it all at one time or are you going to fake multiple trips? Um, some uh, forage producers can deliver hay or will deliver hay. Um, oftentimes there's a fee associated with that. So if you need them to deliver it, make sure you ask about that and um, make sure that you're clear upfront. Um, about what that fee is going to be. And then also think about the labor or equipment needed for unloading that hay and stacking that hay. Um, you know, if you have small square bales, you might want to recruit some help um, to help you unload and stack that hay. If you have um, large round or large square bales, make sure you have the right equipment um, that you need to get that hay unloaded. So there's our final list of, you know, how we can determine if our hay is appropriate. So looking at the type and size of bale, choosing what we think is gonna be the best fit for our farm, looking at the affordability, um, having an expectation for cost, um, considering that bale weight, making sure we're making those price comparisons based on the weight of that hay and not just by the bale. Um, looking at the quality, making sure that the hay is appropriate for your needs, um, maybe asking some questions to the producer about things like maturity, species, um, potential anti-quality factors, and making sure we're matching the quality of that forage with the nutritional needs of our animals. For quantity, um, calculating our hay needs accordingly and making sure we can figure out roughly how much we're gonna need so we know how much we need to purchase. 
And then uh, for accessibility, thinking about those delivery and those transport needs. Um, so that is uh, everything that I had um, for this presentation. I'm, I did throw up you know, my contact information and some other useful links to um, the website and different social media pages. Um, make sure that um, you are following along on there if you're not already. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions if, if people have any, if we have a little bit of time here at the end. anybody have any questions? That, thank you. <laughs> that was very good. Comprehensive. I like how you it, you made the calculation uh, about how much you need a little bit more simple than I've seen because, you know, that can be a, that can be hard. Yeah, it can be really hard to, to, to estimate that, but at least that gives you a place to start. So sure. absolutely. All right. Well, But uh, thank you, but no questions so far. So it looks like um, looks like we're good. Again, everybody, make sure you uh, get the information off the slide so you can contact Amanda if you have questions. And um, of course, you'll get the recording so you can go back over the information if you would like to. And uh, thank you for joining us today. And everybody, uh, have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day.